Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to welcome you on this last lecture in relation to the Super Democracy Exhibition. In previous lectures, Heather Grabby has explained the gap between modern media and our 19th century election tradition. Journalist Franklin Foer stated that we don't think for ourselves anymore, but instead we are simply reproducing a uniform product encouraged by Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon. Julia Caget demonstrated that the access to politics is not that democratic, neither in the USA nor in France or Belgium. Today, Susan Nyman will tackle post-truth and a return to reason. After the Brexit referendum, the election of Donald Trump and the global warming controversy, the Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth to be its 2016 International Word of the Year. The term post-truth can be applied to politicians that address their voters with emotion rather than with facts. E-mocracy instead of democracy is an ancient tendency already, but it has been aggravated by the 24-hour news broadcasting and by social media. The news consumers of today are being informed in a way that above all confirms their, confirms their existing picture of the world. Philo philosophy is not really my cup of tea, but there are four more main reasons why I am eager to hear Susan Nyman's thoughts on the subject. First of all, she acknowledges that social media aggravate fake news, but she claims there are more profound, even philosophical causes that explain this phenomenon. I'm very curious to learn more about those causes. Secondly, I'm reading now a book of our Belgian philosopher, Patrick Loberg, on the liberal rule of law. We call it in Belgium, de rechtsstaat, l'état de droit, which is not linked with any political party, however. The subtitle of Patrick's book is Reasonable, Reason, Reasonableness Can Save Us, but can reason really save democracy? My third reason relates to my appreciation of Yiddish folk music, also known as Kletzmer, and the novels of Isaac Singer on Städte life in former Middle Europa. During the Holocaust, Hannah Arendt, the famous American psychiatrist, escaped from Germany and moved to the US, where she wrote her masterpiece on the banality of evil, Eichmann in Jerusalem. It struck me that you have moved in precisely the opposite direction. You were born in Atlanta, Georgia, but you now work in Potsdam, near to Berlin. I wonder if you would like to give us your thoughts about the political party AFD, Alternative für Deutschland. The famous American philosopher John Rawls kept firing questions at his audience in order to make them think for themselves. In his liberal rule of law, there is consensus on freedom, equality, and fairness as indispensable values for living peacefully together in diversity. In his model, people will try to convince us, e convince each other with reasons, not with fists. How are you going to convince us? This was the fourth reason, and now the floor is completely yours. Thank you. Thank you for that <clears throat> kind introduction. I don't know if I'll be able to answer all of your questions um, because I have a few other things that I had planned to talk about, but we can talk about, I gather there'll be a little time for questions. We can talk a little bit about the AFD day if you'd like, um, happy to do it. So let me uh, tell you what I'm not going to talk about. First of all, I'm not going to talk about fake news in the traditional sense. I'm not going to talk about Russian bots. 
I'm going to speak as little as possible about the man in the White House who is so despised by 65% of Americans that we invent names for him in order to avoid speaking his proper name. The current favorite was given by his own Secretary of State, and debates are still raging over whether he was called a moron or a fucking moron. I do not, and 65% of my country people are uh, agreed with me, I don't want to serve the narcissism of a man who plasters his name on airplanes and stakes, nor am I going to speak about populism directly, partly because it's become a buzzword that I think is very hard to define, almost impossible. So I don't know who any of you are, but I assume that if you took the time to come to a lecture like this, none of you believe that Brexit is going to provide 350 million pounds a week to the British National Health Service, or that Hillary Clinton was running a child sex trafficking ring out of a Washington pizza parlor during her campaign. Uh, these sort of lies were spread uh, and believed rather widely with horrendous outcomes, um, <clears throat> but I trust none of you was involved. I assume that you're progressive, enlightened citizens. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't bother to be here. But isn't exactly progressive circles who no longer believe in progress because they confuse the idea of progress with unlimited neoliberal economic growth? Isn't it exactly those circles who view the Enlightenment not only as obsolete, but as responsible for Eurocentrism and colonialism? Now, it's tempting to believe, uh, to blame lost souls, uh, like the people who believe, believe really stupid fake news for Trump's victory, because it deflects responsibility from people like you and me. In fact, those people made up only half of Trump's voters. Um, and there's now plenty of statistical information that <clears throat> um, the poorest segments of the population voted for Clinton, while half of Trump voters have a yearly income over $100,000. Now, if you think education is a more decisive factor than money, you'll be interested to know that 49% of white voters with college degrees voted for Trump, 45% <clears throat> voted for Clinton, uh, the remaining 6% squandered their votes on hopeless third-party candidates. And the myth that supporters of the AfD, Germany's, I will say a little bit about this, the new right-wing party, uh, are also those left behind by globalization is just as belied by the statistics. Even those few AfD voters, there are few AfD voters who share the extravagant lifestyle of the party leader, Alexander Gauland, um, but even fewer are really economically precarious. So what's going on? Um, few Trump or AfD voters qualify for welfare. Their existence still feels precarious. They can afford their rents or mortgages today, but what about tomorrow? Fear of diminishing prosperity is not a phantasm. As trade becomes more globalized and automation increases, more jobs will be lost, even in places like Germany, whose strong unions have largely shielded it from those developments in the past, nor are factory workers the only people to be affected. Legal contracts, which were drawn up 10 years ago by well-paid lawyers in the US, are now being prepared by equally well-qualified workers in Bangalore. So, it's a thoroughgoing precariousness. The precariousness that many feel today stems from real changes in the global economy, but at least as important is an economic system whose need for relentless growth in consumer spending breeds perpetual satisfaction. And I am sure that each and every one of you, because I have certainly been subject to the, my, this myself, um, even though, uh, I'm somebody who, you know, is, uh, gets paid, among other things, to spend time thinking about these things. You may have a fine apartment, perhaps a home of your own, but celebrity villas pop up when you're browsing the news. Why shouldn't you aspire to have a vacation home as well? 
as any advertising agent can tell you, corporations devote billions, of year, billions every year to producing envy. Um, I strongly recommend Adam Curtis's brilliant documentary, The Century of the Self, which you can see free online. Uh, he describes the enormous effort and psychological savvy that goes into simply producing envy. Those who manage to resist the temptation to envy, as I usually do, uh, have no choice but to spend all the same. The average computer lasts for four years. Smartphones implode even sooner. This is not an accident. Since 1924, capitalism has depended on planned obsolescence. Back then, an international association of major electronics companies decided to reduce the life expectancy of light bulbs from 2,500 hours to 1,000 hours. This is going to seem trivial, but um, it had an enormous effect on the way that we live our lives because before that moment in time, the craft person assumption that a good product should last as long as possible began to crumble. And this was a deliberate corporate decision. It was put into effect with fines for companies that did not go along with making their light bulbs worse. And that began to take place in the automobile industry and everything else. So that today we take for granted that most everything we use will fall apart, short, uh, fall apart shortly after the guarantee runs out. It's no surprise that even relatively comfortable people do feel stabs of in economic insecurity. So today you may have a warm home, enough to eat, an internet connection, even an occasional vacation. Do you have the resources to cope if the boiler and the refrigerator and the computer all break down at once? Well, I don't. Um, in the effect that it should happen, I'm respectable enough to be able to go into debt, um, but not everyone is, all right? Now, I'm not a Marxist. I don't believe that the ills of our current economy explain everything that happens in the voting booth. Brexit, Trump, and the AfD are different, complicated phenomena, but some parallels beg to be drawn. The Nazis' rise to power is often described as a mob reaction, the product of poor people who lost everything to inflation and unemployment, while the liberal elite of the Weimar Republic was playing in Berlin's Golden Twenties. In fact, the Nazi Party's ranks were filled with middle class and upper class educated people. Some of them hoped that Nazi Germany would serve as a bulwark between Russian Bolshevism and Anglo-American utilitarianism. Others were simply opportunists. But neither wealth nor education is any guarantee uh, against anti-democratic and racist values. So I'm not a Marxist. I am a socialist, but I'm not a Marxist. I'm also not a friend of the Leninist idea that things have to get worse before they get better, um, which is why I voted for Hillary Clinton after supporting the Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders in the primaries. But now that the worst has happened in the United States, I've seen signs that occasionally Lenin might be right. Um, the US election has spurred radical rethinking of a kind I have never experienced in my life in the United States. Uh, Trump is not only the naked face of unfettered capitalism, he represents a number of ideas that go far beyond the right. People on the right <coughs> reach for guns when they uh, distrust traditional sources of information. People on the left reach for theory. Arguments are not going to be much help against someone like the moron in the White House who disputes facts as cut and dried as whether it was raining during his inauguration. Um, <clears throat> but in the United States, where contempt for the truth is most glaring, resistance has grown so rapidly it's left even optimist surprise. In, in Europe, many view the American election as a warning, and you should. But successful resistance depends on liberating ourselves from theories that underpin post-truth politics. Uh, 
people who read too many lies, whether they're about child sex rings, weapons of mass destruction, or uh, anything else, can have a tendency to give up looking for truth. But the experience of being frequently lied to is not enough to give up on the concept of truth itself. For that, you need theoretical support. Um, <clears throat> and in our contemporary case, that theoretical support is constructed from a mishmash of postmodern philosophy, evolutionary psychology, and neoliberal economics. Although they may seem to be opposed to each other politically, all of them presuppose a metaphysics of suspicion. And I describe that metaphysics as follows. Every claim to truth conceals a hidden claim to power. Every ideal conceals an interest. I'm going to repeat that because it's really important. And probably all of you have at one time or another expressed that. It's just part of our culture now. Every claim to truth is really a hidden claim to power. And every ideal conceals an interest. <coughs> now, the Iraq war is very easy to use as an example. There was a lot of inflationary rhetoric about good, evil, and democracy. But in fact, the war was fought for regional hegemony, oil, and distraction uh, from what, at the time, uh, much of the American public uh, held uh, the, the presidency in 2002 to be America's historically worse. We did not think it could get worse than George W. Bush. Uh, for many of the war's opponents, the war seemed to prove that every attempt to oppose evil and promote justice is merely a cynical attempt to conceal self-interest with moral rhetoric. And they said it's simply human nature to further your own interest über alles, to help your friends and hurt your enemies. In the words of the Nazi legal philosopher Carl Schmitt, uh, who many progressive thinkers, for reasons I cannot fathom, now take seriously, uh, Schmitt said, anyone who uses the word humanity wants to deceive you. Now, in every generation, this standpoint is presented as something that is bold and new. It can actually be traced back as far as Plato, whose greatest work, The Republic, was written as a rejoinder to it. In recent decades, Michel Foucault has been its most prominent sp spokesperson. Isn't power, he asks, simply a form of warlike domination? Um, going to save some time here. An intro, uh, introductory course in logic could have uh, saved him a lot of confusion. From the fact that some people have blue eyes, you cannot conclude that all eyes are blue. From the fact that some people have, uh, some moral claims are hidden claims to power, you cannot conclude that every claim to act for the common good is a lie. But logic is seldom the strong point of such thinkers. Now, since Foucault's successors are often more impenetrable than he is, it would be silly to claim that most journalists have studied the latest postmodern theory in any detail. But journalists are no less products of their time than anyone else. Even those who never opened a book of theory swim in the ideological currents that swirl around us. Or as Breitbart News put it, politics is downstream from culture. Okay. Um, philosophy is not only meant for conversation with other philosophers, um, even though people who are non-philosophers may simplify uh, what gets said. That's okay. You know, I'm, I'm used to it, um, and I just try to write as clearly as I can, because I believe philosophy is enormously helpful in uncovering the assumptions behind your most cherished views and expanding your sense of what's possible. The words be realistic sound like common sense, but hidden behind them is a metaphysics that underlies many a political position, a whole set of assumptions about what is real and what is not, what is possible and what is imaginable. You can translate the advice to be realistic very simply. It means lower your expectations. 
Uh, when you take such advice, what assumptions are you making about reality? Now, there are a host of other philosophical assumptions that have shaped much of the world since 1989. They're not usually being um, driven by um, actual people who've studied and taught philosophy, but they're all over the air. Neoliberalism suggests, without actually asserting, that there are no values but market values. Evolutionary biology reinforces this idea with unprovable scientific theories claiming that our ancient ancestors and even our very genes have been biologically programmed to reproduce as many of ourselves as possible. Both ideologies assume that claims to truth are claims to power and say if there are any facts at all, they're facts about domination. Now actually, normal human beings do not act this way. Um, with a single exception, Donald Trump embodies all three theories. His claims to truth are claims to power. His values are all material values. And he appears to care about nothing so much as reproducing as many copies of himself, or at least his name, as possible. Uh, fortunately, the theories that describe the behavior of this very singular man cannot be extended to the rest of humankind. We rarely notice such ideologies, usually packaged in simplified form, because they're expressed as self-evident truths, because they're never described as theories we might question, but as simple descriptions of reality. It's very hard to challenge them directly. Those who have learned in college to distrust every claim to truth will hesitate to call a lie a lie. And in fact, shortly before the, uh, it, it, it took the New York Times um, until three weeks before the election and a serious internal meeting, can we use the word lie to describe a presidential candidate? People were coming up with all sort of cute things, well, not entirely true, or perhaps it's a falsehood, or, you know, they were, <laughs> said, no, somebody who lies all the time should be described as lying all the time. Now, the right knows very well how to exploit its opponent's uncertainties. And they say things like, Darwin offers one narrative, the Bible another. Who can decide what's best? 99% of climate scientists believe that fossil fuel emissions are threatening the planet. But who says the opinion of experts should prevail? And I was amazed to actually read this publisher, Andrew Breitbart, responsible for a great deal of the fake news in the world, uh, laid out his strategy this way, and I quote from Breitbart, in the 21st century, media is everything. The left wins because it controls the narrative. The narrative is controlled by the media. The left is the media. Narrative is everything. I am at war to gain back control of the American narrative. And in a recent uh, interview with The New Yorker, his slightly less warlike colleague, but who also operates a very successful uh, far-right website, uh, said, look, I read postmodern theory in college. If everything is a narrative, then we just need alternatives to the dominant narrative. And then he smiled and said, I don't seem like a guy who reads Lacan, do I? <laughs> Now, the French philosophy Bruno Latour does take some responsibility for the right's use of postmodern theory um, and cited the fact that climate deniers were using his own work and his skepticism about science to uh, argue that maybe climate change wasn't real. Um, and uh, Latour was uh, honest enough to say, you know, maybe I was wrong. There are, you know, entire PhD programs that are still running to make sure good American kids are learning that facts are made up, that there's no such thing as natural, unmediated access to truth, that we're always prisoners of language, we always speak from a particular sign standpoint, and so on, while dangerous extremists are using the very same argument of social construction to destroy hard-worn evidence that could save people's lives. Okay? Left-wing uh, theories of the past few decades have only revealed what was already a problem for Marxism. And in my book, Moral Clarity, I argued that Marx's materialism was the downfall of social democracy. 
what paralyzed the left was not only the brutality of some of the pra practices that uh, accompanied Marxist governments, but the contradictions in Marxist theory itself. Marx's original appeal was its claim to realize the ideal of justice that Enlightenment thinkers had formulated but didn't think through all the way. Uh, Marx taught us a truth that now seems trivial. Uh, freedom of speech of a newspaper publisher is not the same thing as the freedom of speech of a demonstrator who stands in the street and holds up a sign. This was not a critique of the ideals of enlightenment. It was a demand for their real fulfillment. Uh, and it was important in progressive criticism. But the ideals that inspired the movement were undercut by its metaphysics, which never advanced beyond the perennial fashionable so sophist views that Plato criticized. For Marxists, ideals are nothing but ideologies, rationalizations without a real foundation, whether philosophy, art, or religion, all exist to conceal the real relations, that is, the economic relations, that determine our lives. And I think the dissonance between tone and substance corrodes Marxist theory. Marx's stirring prose about justice moved many a heart, but any good mind will be puzzled by Marx's turn to uh, declare ideals and justice part of the superstructure, just a matter of ornate packaging. Um, some scholars tried to offer solutions to the dilemma by looking for crucial differences between his early and late work, um, but the gap remains immense, and even people who don't go in for careful textual analysis can feel it in their bones. Now, most of us today are students of Marx without knowing it, uh, conservatives usually most of all. Anybody who believes Bertolt Brecht's claim, first comes the grub and then comes the ethics, erst kommt das Fressen, dann kommt die Moral, uh, is thinking in Marxist terms. Chronologically, Brecht was right. People who are hungry and freezing are not in a position to think about much else. Um, but it's a leap from chronology to the view that money always trumps morals, but it's a leap, leap we often take. Profits and losses can be measured, and if what can be measured is all that matters, public action becomes a matter of deal-making with no space for principles at all. The measure of all things becomes just, does it profit myself and my tribe? and I use the word tribe to define any self-defined group on any identity, whether it's race, gender, class, uh, anything else. Now, the past decades have led many people to question that view. Um, unfortunately, the most successful among them are not Occupy Wall Street demonstrators, but fundamentalists and nationalists who continue to cast their spell. It's a great mistake to view uh, the members of those movements as simply the losers of globalization. Uh, <coughs> more profit would not make them more satisfied. There's a lot of empirical studies that showed jihadists to be usually more educated and successful than their neighbors. They aren't asking for a bigger piece of the pie they're refusing the plate on which it's served. Young women who cover their heads, some of them, um, some of them are forced to, but some of them decide to do it because they refuse to be part of a world in which their bodies are simply commodities. The young nationalists who insist on ethnic identity do not want to live in a world where every city in the world looks like every other because multinational corporations have destroyed local business. Um, this is not to condone the excesses of those who stubbornly b uh, beat the drum of their religion or their tribe, but those who want to oppose them will not succeed without understanding the roots of the problem and what we, as I'm going to assume, enlightened progressive people have done to contribute to it. So who are we? All those who fail to see clearly that the only alternative to tribal thinking is universalism. 
Unfortunately, the concept has a terrible reputation among progressive intellectuals who view it as the prototype of every claim to power that disguises particular interests. During the, later sta the earlier stages, uh, uh, the later stages of, uh, ident uh, of the civil rights movement in America, it was just such people who supported identity politics, which is an idea that harkens back to the reactionary nationalism of Carl Schmitt. Um, anybody who believes that truth is merely power will uh, quickly conclude the, that the only interests that count are the interests of one's tribe. And the development is particularly tragic because the early civil rights and post-colonialist movements resolutely oppose tribal thinking. Their strengths were impressed in songs that claimed things like, this was an American civil rights song that I sang as a young teenager, all men are slaves till our brothers are free. Instead of declaring all history a matter of narrative rather than truth, post-colonialism could have broadened history's scope. Um, it is simply true that non-Europeans, as I assume all Belgians know, uh, often from rich and complex cultures were exploited and killed by Europeans. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who suspected what was coming, wrote in 1754 about Europeans who traveled to Africa, quote, more intent on filling their pockets than their heads. But these are truths that tend to vanish when the truth, concept of truth is dissolved entirely. So identity politics is a very dangerous game. If the demands of minorities are not seen as human rights but as rights of particular groups, what presents the majority for, uh, from insisting on its own? And this is precisely what happened during Trump's election as well as in identity movements that have grown in England and France and Holland and Austria, uh, who are simply presenting themselves as uh, part of a harmless trend. If other groups are allowed to fight for their rights, why shouldn't white Europeans stand up for theirs? Now, the answer is really not very difficult. Um, shortly after Trump was elected, there was a debate in the US uh, around the question, was liberal support for identity politics to blame for the results? Did so-called minor issues about discrimination alienate white voters who went on to support Trump for uh, more fundamental economic reasons? I think this question is put entirely wrong. The murder of unarmed African Americans that led to the Black Lives Matter movement is not a minor issue, it's a crime, and so is violence against women and gays. But for those who believe that only tribal interests are genuine, calls for universal outrage in the face of those crimes makes no sense. Um, Hannah Arendt thought that Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann should have been tried not for crimes against the Jewish people, which is what he was tried for in Jerusalem, but for crimes against humanity. Uh, it's a distinction that didn't seem so important at the time, but its importance is increasingly clear. My support for Black Lives Matter uh, doesn't spring from tribal membership, nor from guilt about wrongs committed by my ancestors. My hap ancestors happen to be poor Eastern Jews who uh, immigrated to Chicago in the early 20th century. So uh, they weren't slaveholders, they weren't um, you know, directly responsible uh, for forms of racism, but I support Black Lives Matter because the killing of unarmed people is a crime against humanity. Um, at the same time, I'm going to reject the white counter movement, which says all lives matter. This is a trend, I don't know if you've followed it in the States, but basically Trump supporters have been calling Black Lives Matter racist because they say all lives matter. Um, this is ridiculous because it's using a very banal truth, yes, of course all lives matter, um, to distract attention from a very important empirical truth, namely that African Americans are far more subject to police violence than anybody else. This is an empirical fact, but you need to have a concept of truth in order to see it. Um, I'm gonna skip just because I see that time is running out and I wanna make sure that uh, we have at least a little time for questions. Um, I'll just 
summarize this piece and assure you that <clears throat> there is very good news coming out of the United States, and I don't know how much you read about it. There is an enormous resistance to the government, the likes of which have not been, were not even seen in the 60s. Um, so um, there's good news. Um, <laughs> believe me. And I was just there in, I spent six months in Mississippi, which is the worst of the worst, doing research for another book. And I was amazed to see the numbers of people and of all ages, black and white, coming together to resist this government in all kinds of creative ways. So it's happening on a local level, um, and it's quite inspiring. You should just know that. Okay. So what are the general principles that underpin need to underpin a resistance, um, both in Europe? and in the States, okay? Um, few kinds of amnesia are more damaging than the claim that Brexit and Trump signal the end of enlightenment. This is a book that was, a uh, claim that was made by Pankaj uh, Mishra in a book that got some attention. Um, this is really not the first time that the uh, obituary for the enlightenment was written. People do it all the time. Um, the concept of homo economicus, the idea that we are fundamentally moved only by material interests, wasn't proposed until a century after the Enlightenment and didn't enjoy widespread popularity until the Cold War. Um, but behavioral economists like Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman have proved, if you want scientific proof, without reflecting on yourself, I mean, if we think about how we actually live in practice, we do not act this way. We do all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons um, outside of our economic interest. But if you want, you know, hard, cold uh, economic proof, you can look at the work of Daniel Kahneman, uh, and he shows how often people do not act in order to ma maximize their economic interests. Now, Many people have used his work to argue uh, that human beings are simply irrational. But there's another way to go. Uh, it's possible to use that data, among other things, to re-examine the idea of reason itself. The Enlightenment's idea of reason was profoundly different than its critics imagine. <coughs> um, for Enlightenment thinkers, reason is the ability to use universal values, particularly the values of truth and justice, for orientation and thinking. These values are as clear in African and Asian history as they are in Europe. The charge of Eurocentrism was first raised by Enlightenment thinkers who repeatedly told us how much Europeans could learn from other cultures, and they often took considerable risks in order to do so. In 1723, for example, uh, the German philosopher Christian Wolff had to choose between death and exile uh, and leave his home and his university within 48 hours. What was his crime? He argued that the Chinese could be moral without being Christian, okay? Um, and talked about, wanted to take Chinese ethics and Chinese philosophy seriously. So uh, all kinds of examples coming from the much maligned enlightenment about that. Nor is reason opposed to nature, as the romantics uh, lamented, though one of reason's tasks is to question specific conditions which are supposed to be natural. So consider how often slavery, torture, poverty, racism, and sexism are called natural to suggest that they will never change. Reason isn't opposed to nature, but to any authority that defends its power by restricting thinking to a small elite. Um, Enlightenment philosophers were entirely aware that reason has limits. They just weren't prepared to let the authorities define them. In their day, the authorities were aristocrats supported by church doctrine proclaiming the divine rights of kings. Today, the authorities are largely neoliberal economic advisors who support the alleged naturalness of their ideology with evolutionary psychology. Okay. So reason and logic require instrumental rationality, but this is only a very small part of reason's scope. Mm. 
Reason is less a matter of knowledge than a demand, and the demand is just this. For everything that happens, find the reason why it happened this way and not otherwise. Philosophers call this the principle of uh, sufficient reason, and it, it, it's meant to say, look, um, there are many different reasons you can give, but some things don't count as reason, like that's just the way it always was, <laughs> or I heard it somewhere. Um, the ability to find reasons is the basis of scientific inquiry as well as social justice. The child is following the principle of sufficient reason when she asks why it's raining, and she'll continue to ask questions until the adult supplies a satisfying answer or tells her to stop asking so many questions. But every child will also wonder the first time she sees a homeless person on the street, uh, why doesn't he have a bed? Why doesn't the refugee child have a home? And adults who are serious about giving an answer have to move from explanation to action. That's the possibility of reason, okay? Um, the OED, as uh, you just mentioned beforehand, defined post-truth. Uh, I don't like their definition. It's relating uh, circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Um, I think the, that definition, which a lot of people accept, uh, proposes a binary opposition between facts and feelings that does justice to neither one. Uh, feelings and facts are deeply related. If my children are threatened, I will feel anger. If other peoples are threatened by a sex trafficking ring or more likely by war and hunger, I ought to feel anger. Um, the task is not to forego feeling in favor of fact, but to make sure that the two work in harmony. Politics can be driven by fear or values. It's easy to see where the politics of fear has led. Um, and I think it's attracted so many people because we're uneasy about defining and defending our own values, um, a task that even conservatives are reluctant to undertake today. A society that cannot give people the feeling that their lives have more meaning than the everlasting acquisition of new toys will fail. And those who dismiss moral appeals as Sunday sermons cannot offer a vision of human dignity. In fact, the world changes whenever certain ideas are established as norms. Here's an example that was forgotten today. During the Vietnam War, it was common knowledge that the easiest way to avoid the draft was to pretend to be gay. Uh, this was no secret. There were popular songs about it at the time. Not until Obama's presidency could gays and lesbians openly serve in the military. So I know men against the war who moved to Canada, served jail time, or even went to Vietnam. Not a single one was willing to pretend to be gay even for the half hour it took to face a draft board. Uh, jokes about it were made during, you know, smoke-filled evenings. No one wanted to face a rumor that the gay pose was perhaps not a pretense, perhaps he's really gay. Now, um, today, same-sex weddings can be uh, celebrated in conservative places like Spain and Ireland and the United States. So, the you know, this is an example of how within one generation you've had ideas change the world in an extremely uh, deep and important way. I have a whole pocket full of other examples, but I've recently discovered that this is the one example that nobody challenges, so I'm giving it to you. Um, of course, the converse is true as well. The world will change again if the political strategies that uh, tr elected Trump become the norm. Um, uh, and resisting the urge to normalize is exhausting. I'm just trying to shorten a bit here. Um, okay, Let me stop here. And so I'm going over a bit, but um, democracy requires citizens who are able to reflect on the words that they use. We accept so many phrases without thinking about their meaning. Using mantras like responsibility to our shareholders 
Neoliberalism dresses its conviction that nothing matters but profit in gentle colors. Who can, ex uh, who can object to responsibility, right? Responsibility sounds great. Um, but responsibility to our shareholders, that is, let's get more and more and more profit, is, um, you know, use an excuse all the time. Um, there's another one that I know uh, will be even more controversial in the low countries. They're well-intentioned calls for tolerance. Um, I hate the concept tolerance um, because people tend to forget that in ordinary life we tolerate things that we can't stand and can't change. Noise, um, bad smells, pain, you know, those are I can tolerate the headache or, you know, I can tolerate the stink in the uh, subway system. Um, telling a right-wing nationalist to show more tolerance reminds him of his powerlessness. I much prefer appeals to solidarity, pointing to the blessings that arise when cultures work together. And it's striking that even in countries which have seen nationalist movements lately, right-wing nationalist movements, um, in the cities there are mayors from non-native backgrounds that are governing in Paris and Rotterdam and London um, because you can actually see um, how, what a blessing it is to live in a multi multicultural society. I don't think this needs to uh, lead to an unraveling of indigenous traditions. On the contrary, if you actively enjoy other cultures rather than simply tolerating them, uh, you'll also find it easier to enjoy your own. Now, Europe could serve as an example of how cultural diversity can coexist with political unity, providing Europe discovers its own ideals. Uh, for many of its citizens today, Europe represents nothing more than a domestic market run on neoliberal principles by a faceless Brussels bureaucracy. Um, as I just last week actually finally became a European citizen um, in addition to an American one, but I know I'm speaking as an outsider because Europeans, progressive Europeans anyway, hate nothing so much as people who praise Europe, <laughs> which is much more easy for outsiders to do. But the truth is sometimes outsider, outsiders see things more clearly than Europeans themselves. Um, despite its many difficulties, Europeans have not only managed to trade war for peaceful negotiation, that's the thing that you always hear, um, but what none of you realize because you grew up in the middle of it and you take it for granted is that even in uh, countries that are largely ruled by Christian democratic parties, uh, Europe is a place where healthcare, education, workers' rights, uh, parental rights, um, uh, the possibility of vacation, this sounds really trivial. Um, those are seen as human rights and not as privileges or benefits that are granted to a few wealthy people. That's a basic social democratic system, you know, even though of course we can complain, oh, and you know, serious money for funding for the arts, did I mention that? Um, in the United States, Russia, China, India, Brazil, um, those gains and the gains that they're rights and not privileges seem utopian to people. And I, I think I will simply end because um, we don't have any time to, to uh, talk if I don't. I will simply end that those of you who are here in the capital of Europe, um, which I know probably provides extra challenges to be a strong supporter of Europe. Um, remember what it is that you take for granted that people outside Europe don't have. And the only way to make Europe better and stronger and less problematic is to value what has actually been achieved here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nyman. Are there any questions or remarks? The lady, push the red button, please, on the microphone. This one?
Professor, you, you just mentioned Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, you support Black Lives Matter. I lived in the United States for 16 years. And I, I switched, I came to Brussels because of what you mentioned, tribalism in America. I left because America at this point in time, it's contradicting itself. Stating the Constitution says a uh, representative republic. And what I found is a country worse than what, is pro what probably happened in South Africa. Black Lives Matter is fomenting hatred towards white people. And as a black woman who doesn't believe in the, um, or say, racism and victimization, the culture of victimhood, I am, I was subjected to intimidation and threats in liberal New York. So I have, I'm surprised that you would support Black Lives Matter. Okay, you are, you're now talking on a, um, an important level of nuance that I'm actually working on in a new book that I'm writing about this subject. I support because until Black Lives Matter raised the issue, white Americans, even if they had black friends, which many don't, I mean, it's a very segregated culture, white Americans were simply not aware of the level of everyday violence that uh, African Americans have to fear and have to Except, I mean, even the very, I have been thinking, you know, the talk, this is something that's been discussed in America that every black parent at some point has with their children about how to behave if they're stopped by the police. Now, everybody who raises children knows, my God, how, um, you know, there's so many things that you worry about your children. The one thing that I do not have to worry about is that if they go out, they could, because of their color, particularly my son, um, just be randomly shot because he didn't take his hands out of his pockets or something, you know? So I support Black Lives Matter for having brought that issue to real attention. Um, even if the violence hasn't stopped, there are police departments all over the country who are doing something about it. But you're absolutely correct. There's a tendency in many Black Lives Matter activists, though by no means all of them. I mean, Cornell West, for example, who's been at the forefront. Um, no, <laughs> I'm not going to go into the details about Cornell West, but um, how do you explain the black on black violence? Black people killing black people in Chicago, where Barack Obama comes from, in New York. I lived in the Bronx. I lived in many different places in New York, and it is very dangerous for me as a black woman of course to be it is. subjected to violence from black people. Of course it is. Um, I explain most of the violence through an economic system that leaves very few chances for young people, especially young men, to envision anything other than either working at McDonald's or dealing drugs. Um, and honestly, if those were my two choices, I know that I would not be working at McDonald's, you know? Um, so if you have an entire system put in place where you have terrible educational prospects for people, um, you have the lifetimes of people um, being stuck in particular patterns where their parents have often been in jail. Um, and, you know, yes, there's black and black on um, black crime. I don't deny it in the least, but I also know that the rates of incarceration, say, for simple, um, you know, crimes, still crimes in some states, possession of marijuana, you know, I don't know how many people here haven't smoked marijuana, but I, off, you know, assume this is a pretty small, um, you know, I mean, smoking marijuana is ex has become extremely uh, uh, common all over the place. Um, the rates of incarceration for black people, uh, you know, who are caught with marijuana are 10 times as high for the r rates of uh, white people. 
Uh, the difference between sentencing for crack cocaine is much different than the se se sentencing of white collar executive cocaine that's not crack. So you have a whole pattern which I think has left a generation or two generations actually of young black men in particular. Um, let me tell you a story. Yes, can we see the, the dependence of women, the, the black women and the dependency on government? The New Deal, 1960s New Deal, that forced a whole lot of black women into dependency, government dependency. And that's one of the reasons why their children are ending up on the street, ending up on drugs, ending up in jail. Two million black men in jail is the direct result of policies instituted by Lyndon B. Johnson, destroying the black family, and it went from there. So I was born in a colony, the Dutch colony. I now live in Belgium. So I have a whatever colonial background, as you would say, I was born on a plantation. So um, when Europeans talk about poverty of people, I lived under colon colonization, and I had my basic education, the best years of my life, okay? So anti-colonialism destroyed my country and displaced me to Europe. So Europeans, when they think and talk about poor people and all this time, the overanalyzation of things, make things or make life more complicated than it has to be. So maybe Europeans can learn from that, I don't hope. I'm hoping, I came back to Europe and I hope that Europe doesn't adapt or just simply take over what people tell them that, oh, you need to do this or you need to do that. You, you just mentioned Europe walked away from itself, is losing credibility the same way America has. So this, this is, it could be an interesting conversation that could go on all afternoon if we had the time for it. I agree with you, and I find this, you know, not just about people with color, but also about women. I'm very uh, unhappy about people taking up a victimhood narr narrative. I don't like doing it. I don't think it's productive. Um, so uh, I, I share oh, your... Yeah, yeah, I share your not wanting to go in that direction. But I'm going to tell you a personal story that... Um, that I was actually ashamed about, but I, I decided it's time for me to, um, to tell this story about white racism. So I grew up with a mother who was involved in the civil rights movement. We were just, you know, absolutely, I grew up with the children of Martin Luther King, um, you know, who are my age. I, I did not think of myself as anything but a universalist, okay, my whole life long. A few years back, um, I'm walking down the street in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale College is, where I once taught. And uh, Yale College is a, it's an Ivy League university on the edge of the fourth poorest, uh, at least it used to be, black ghetto in America. I'm walking down the street, and a very large, young black man, uh, dressed casually, as many kids do, pants a little low, you know, um, start, is, coming towards me very quickly down the street. And I got a little bit nervous because it was clear, oh yeah, yeah, no, it's, I'm not imagining this, he is running straight to me. And I get a little tense and I think, well, okay, but it's daylight and anyway, we're near the university, so it's okay, so I'll see what he wants from me. And he says, Aren't you the woman who I saw last week on Tavis Smiley? Tavis Smiley is a black talk show. <laughs> and I, I hated myself. Because I said, here's this kid who took the time to watch me discuss my book on um, you know, a national television show, and I still had the stereotype young black predator. You know, I don't think I gave it away, I, but that was what went through my head. That was my first impression. And I feel like if I felt that as someone who really grew up, you know, in the middle of the civil rights movement, um, you know, where, you know, white racism is a real fact of life. So, and, and I, you know, I, I agree with you that one needs a more universalist view. One needs to combat some of the trends that have been happening you know, I mean, since the Civil Rights Movement, since the Black Panthers, all of that. 
One needs to combat them, but one also has to recognize um, that white racism is real. I'm yeah. afraid we're about to... I'm not going to call people racist, but that's another discussion. I think the word racism is like overblown. Everybody's being called a racist. If you're white, you're racist. If you see this, you're racist. I'm so sorry, if is, I had seen yeah. a young white man coming towards me excitedly, I would not have gotten tense. I get tense, I get tense, but that has nothing to do with racism. <laughs> yeah. That's not racism. Can I ask a sure. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. All right. Um, as a, an American living in Germany, do you think the payback time for Germany, for what it did in the last century, is gone? It's finished? Um, so a year from now, you'll be able to read in Flemish a book that I'm just writing. It's called Learning from the Germans. It's a, it's a question that has a really, really long answer. And so I'm writing an entire book about it. Look, I, I think that facing one's own criminal, violent past is probably not a process that can ever be finished. And I think that's one of the things that the Germans have taught us. But I think they have been exemplary in working on it in all kinds of ways that we could all learn from. And that's why I'm writing a, a book about it. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, you, you spoke of the uh, sense of precariousness that many people are feeling, in particular Trump voters, AFD voters. Uh, so, and the, the envy towards those who are better off, the envy of material wealth. Uh, but isn't there also, paradoxically, a, a French journalist said, said it this way, a strange jealousy towards those who are worse off. So minorities, immigrants, refugees, welfare recipients, affirmative action recipients, that, that kind of resentment. Well, that has been played out by um, right-wing parties, of course. Um, and take Eastern Germany in particular, where percentually there was a larger number of people who voted for the AfD than in West Germany, although in uh, hard numbers there were more Westerners who did. Um, look. What is absolutely true is that East Germany was treated very badly during the, the reunification. And so there are a lot of East, most East Germans uh, believe that it was a colonization and not a reunification. So there's a resentment there and a belief that somehow the refugees are taking away, everybody else is you know, taking things away from them and now come the refugees and there'll be even less. This is so ridiculous. If anybody saw how people are actually living in the refugee homes, you know, it's like people who listen to Trump about the immigrants taking away our jobs, their jobs that nobody else wants to do. Um, so, but it is as, you know, right, the right wing has found often enough it's very easy to blame one's own worries on an outsider group. It's just the easiest thing to do. But no, that is not really happening. What might be happening in a certain sense, and this is, this is interesting, um, as this woman was saying before, um, there has become a certain currency of being part of a, 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 a recognized group of victims. So even if people are not being, at least I thought you were saying that, but you're, <laughs> I misunderstood you, I'm sorry. So I will say this on my account. There is certainly, and I don't, I, I've done a lot of work to ar ar argue against this. I don't, um, I don't think it's right. Um, but the claim to victimhood has often um, produced a kind of recognition in the last 50 years that ordinary people don't get that. Okay, I wasn't phrasing it properly, but that is, you know, and I think that's really problematic and I'm writing another book about that. So, <laughs> so um, you know, it may be the case that people are missing the kind of recognition that they feel, and it's certainly true in the States, it's certainly true with the AfD, I mean, those are the two countries that I follow the most closely, um, but to 
trade the sense of recognition for what's actually, um, um, you know, they're not getting material uh, things that, let's say, majority citizens uh, are getting. I mean, they're, they're just, look at, look at the level at which immigrants and refugees live. It's really rough, and that's even when they've been accepted and are put into some kind of state housing. Um, it's not something that any of us would be happy about. Um, so that's just used. Um, I see that my friend here, uh, I actually have it to give another lecture in Holland. So while I'd love to continue this conversation, I can't. Um, but uh, if Carl invites me to come back and talk another talk about another book, I'll be happy to do so next year. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is this your bag? Thank you. And I have a little present. Oh, how can yeah, I find a souvenir? Oh, and I thank you very much. I love Belgian chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. I'm going to